Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church to our live stream service. Uh, as the other staff gathers here, one of the things that you cannot see on the camera is that we have X's here, X's on the floor. Uh, I am now six feet away from you, Brenda. Yes, you are, and stay that way. And, and Nancy, <laughs> I've got 12 feet here, so I mean, we're, we're golden. <laughs> Justin, you're, you're, you're five foot, 10 inches. You, okay, okay, you're, you're there, you're good, you're good, you're good. <laughs> so, uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to worship, and, and I hope that this time together um, is a blessing. Have a few announcements this week. We, we realized last week that we weren't announcing anything, and just because it feels like all of our the announcement is there's no announcements, but there, there are announcements, and, and we have a few. Mary put it together, and she was able to, uh, once again, put things in red, so <laughs> I will know what to do. And the first one I have to say is the Linton concert this last Wednesday was fabulous. Thank you. Well done. And there's Thank another you. one coming. Piano this week. And, and I have a confession to make because, you know, uh, you, you want to be free of guilt. I snuck in the back door and listened live. <laughs> Uh, in person. So don't do that. Uh, don't, don't do that. Uh, uh, don't follow my example during a pandemic, please. Um, a, a friendly reminder from Sue, um, uh, please uh, mail in donations and or we have opportunities online. There's the, what, is it, what do they call the squiggly thing? You have to be more specific. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a thing that you can, you can, so bar, uh, oh, a QR code. QR code, squiggly Thanks, thing. Uh, look for a squiggly thing and, and give that way if you want. Um, I want to give a real special thanks to deacons and to others who are making phone calls through the week, checking on people. We've, we've gathered a good group of people who are doing this, and uh, it's, it's really, really helpful, uh, not only to those who are being called, but I think to those who are calling, just... You know, we all need something to do, and, and that's a great thing right now that our, our congregation, even though we're not gathering, we are connecting. And to that end, just a reminder that uh, we are working hard on thinking through Holy Week. So at this point, Monday, Thursday will happen, and then there's a, a, an Indonesian service on Good Friday that will happen, but they'll be virtual. Um, do we want to talk about Easter at all? We're working on it. We're working on it. We're, we're using our imagination. Is that fair to say? We, we hope to do something uh, physical. I know that's a taboo word right now. So needless to say, if, if Justin is using his imagination, it should be exciting. It should be very, very <laughs> exciting. Um, we're, we're continuing to look for creative ways, not only on Easter, but, but throughout the week. And, and ch so check the website and, and look for e-blasts from the, from the congregation so that there may be opportunities to come up where we can abide by the shelter in place and the self-quarantine and the distancing, but also recognize that, that we also need to move around. And, and hopefully will be some opportunities this week to do that. Um, before I ask Nancy to, to explain a little bit more, we want to give a really big special thanks to our interns, to, to Ryan and Beth. Um, they uh, were told your internship is done by the seminary, which is, which is fine, but our, our interns turned to us and said, we want to keep caring. And uh, what, a, what a great mark. And, and it bodes well for their, their future in ministry, that, that that was their heart. So. I know that Ryan is calling folks who are shut in or who are in need of help from Indiana. Um, uh, well done, Ryan. And, and, and Beth is working on something. Yes, uh, we're so grateful to Beth. She is on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook channel, and we encourage everyone to listen to her Lenten study. And uh, she's doing a phenomenal job. There's even a work, sh work uh, sheet to go along with it. So please check that out. As well as we have a puppet um, skit or two that are up there. And we have now, we're asking the Sunday school teachers to read stories to the children. So I'll keep emailing and we'll keep letting you know about all that information, but keep watching, thanks. So remember the last thing, remember that if we start to fade in and out, 
That's, that's not a, a technical issue here, that's a, a national issue. And you, if, if, so if you miss something, you can watch later if live becomes, am I saying this the right way? The hope is that regardless of the uh, jitteriness of the stream, when it plays back afterwards, it should be clear. It's everyone else Facebook living at the same time we are. Which is, a, which is a great witness to our faithfulness, that, that as a, a country in the midst of a challenge, we're, we're worshiping almost too much. Never well, not, too, not much. too much. Never too much, but, but, but we're faithful, and you're faithful, and, and that's a great inspiration to all of us. So with that, I think that's enough announcements. We covered it. Okay. Uh, call to worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 86, 1 through 6, and verse 15. Hear now the word of God. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Let us pray. Creator God, you are the great I am. You are the resurrection and the life. As we worship together this day, show us who we are, bearers of good news, messengers of the resurrection. Guide us through this Lenten season as we await for Easter. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd like to welcome all my friends to come closer to their screens. I think I see Taylor and Bella and Miles. I hope you're all with me this morning, or with us. And can one of you tell me what season of the church we are in? I hear you, it's Lent. Yes, I'm so proud of you. This morning's Bible story reminds us about showing kindness to others. One time, Jesus was visiting his friend Lazarus and his sisters Mary and Martha, in their home in a town called Bethany. While he was there, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary 
decided to host a party for Jesus. They all enjoyed a great meal and were relaxing in the living room after dinner when one of the other guests, also named Mary, took out a jar of expensive oil. She dipped her long hair in the oil and then rubbed it on Jesus' feet. She anointed his feet in a way to show Jesus how much she loved him. Judas, one of the other disciples, complained that the oil should have been sold and the money given to the poor. But Jesus appreciated Mary's act of kindness and love. We can't invite Jesus to dinner in the same way that Lazarus did. But Jesus is with us in spirit, but not in a way that we can anoint his feet. We can show Jesus that we love him by doing many acts of kindness and love for others. Today, um, we invited one of our deacons, Reed, and his daughter, Ella, to tell you about their recent act of kindness. Welcome, Ella and Reed. to thank them. My dad drove me to Grand Bay Hospital and let me stand through the sunroof in my car while he honked the horn like a crazy man to get everyone's attention. When the ambulance workers saw the sign, they all got into their ambulances, started honking their horns, and put on their sirens. It was really cool. Please think about doing something like this to show your support and thanks to the heroes. Thank you. Good morning once again. Um, just want to thank everyone for listening to Ella, considering her idea. Um, I could say that the doctors, nurses, and the ambulance workers really appreciated the gesture. Um, so we must always remember that people need people at this time, whether that's through masks, through social distancing, or communicating with each other over 100 feet away. People need people. We will get through this together. Please join Ella and I in prayer at this time. Tender Jesus, so meek, so mild, teach us to be like you in all our ways. Teach us kindness, gentleness, generosity, and to be giving, forgiving, loving, and caring. Teach us to follow in your humble footsteps. Guide us to the place you want us to be. Take control. Mold and shape us into the brilliant beings we were always destined to become. Thank you.
Thank you, Amy. That was wonderful. And thank you, Ella. That was a phenomenal thing you did. Well done. Well, let's continue with worship with our, our scripture lesson. This is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth verse, 21 through 26. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said to those in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I, I say to you that if you're angry with a brother or a sister, you're liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to counsel. And if you say, you, you fool. You'll be liable to the hell of fire. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser, while you're on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you'll be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The gospel of our Lord, praise be to Christ. Let's pray. Almighty and gracious God, help us to hear your word, to, to find our way to follow you. For we know you lead us unto freedom. Help us this day to have ears to hear and eyes to see. Amen. Well, as we're entering week three of shelter in place and self-quarantine, the, the, the possibility of frustration and patience wearing thin is, uh, well, it's rather high. In fact, it might just be a guarantee. So a teaching of Jesus about anger might be the most appropriate or the most frustrating. It's hard to say. Before we venture into this unknown, let me make one thing clear. Jesus' teaching about anger, it's not a call for you to suppress anger or manage anger or deny it. We all do and we all will get angry. The teaching here is how do we become slow to anger? Slow. As we work through the parts of the passage today, I want you to keep an image in mind. It's a handy image for anger. Think of a dial with numbers one to 10. One is frustration or annoyance. 10 is rage. A lot of what we're going to consider today is this. How do we gain the ability to not turn the dial? We do turn this dial. What if we were to gain the power to resist? turning our frustration into anger and our anger into rage. To do this, I want to give you three myths about anger. There are three really big misconceptions about anger that shape our lives, and, and if we know them and see them, our life will change for the better. We may, in essence, resist the temptation to turn the dial. If we can resist this temptation, we'll live better. We can be saved from the self-destruction of anger. The first myth of anger is that you have a right to anger. You have a right to be angry. We know this and trust this. This confidence in anger forms the basis of categorically bad advice that's all too common we've all heard said or most likely both you should be angry 
You need to get angry. The right to be angry is behind the question, how are you not angry about this? From this right, we tell people, don't take that. Or you need to give that person a piece of your mind, which both may be true. We're not required to endure bad behavior, and there are certainly times we need to speak up. But anger is not necessary. In fact, when it comes to protest, to opposition, to speaking your mind, anger is a very bad thing. Anger will garble your words and, and overwhelm the truth. You probably have said to someone, all I can hear is your anger. In our Constitution, there are a series of rights in the First Amendment. The right to speak, the right to assemble, the freedom of the press. Each of these implies, with this myth, anger. But they do not make it right, or more importantly, a right. We generally don't worry about the right to speak if the person is saying nice things. We, we don't worry about a gathering of people if they're happy. We don't have much concern about the press that speaks complimentary words. The right is in the need to critique, to oppose, to fight against. All of these are sacrosanct in our nation, yet none are truly about anger. We do not have a right to be angry. Speak, protest, gather, write, yes. Be angry, no. The second myth is that anger gets things done. That anger is a positive force for change and action is a myth. It's not true. Anger is an energy for sure, but it's only a negative one. Anger is not a positive energy. If you want to tear things down, burn things down, destroy things, you can tap into the energy of anger. But it will not create or sustain good things. Hence, anger does not get things done that are positive. More importantly here, it's, it's a dangerous energy. Consider power tools. I have a lot of power tools. I love them. I have circular saws and routers and a table saw and a jigsaw and a reciprocating saw. And, and power drills, I, I have lots of them, too. I have a drywall drill, a cordless drill, a corded drill. My favorite drill, though, is the hammer drill. <laughs> it's really big. And it makes holes in cinder block and, and concrete. Power. Having all these tools, though, comes with a rule. If I make a mistake in a project, then I stop entirely. Even if I just started working on something, I walk away from the tools. If I cut the wrong side or measure it incorrectly, I do this because the mistake tells me I'm too tired or unfocused to handle the power within the tools. My day job is best performed with 10 fingers and two eyes. I need not risk the danger. And so it is with anger. If you need to tear something down, demolish something, don't do it with anger. You'll be at risk for injury. The wild, out of control nature of anger is too risky. It's only destructive. Convincing yourself otherwise is part of the power of anger to no longer think straight. The third myth of anger is the one most likely to cause uh, arguments. The third myth is, is that there is a righteous anger or justified anger. So not only is anger not a right, anger is not justified. Oftentimes when I say this, someone will, will raise their hand in a study and say, hey, wait, 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 Jesus got angry. 
he cleared the temple and he was really angry. The logic here is that if Jesus got angry, well, so can we. We're justified. Our anger is just. Jesus did it. And I get that. There's a strong logic here. Only the text doesn't say that. Jesus cleared the temple. He had a whip, according to John, and drove the money changers from the temple. Yet never does it say, Jesus got angry and then, or in a rage, he, we read in the anger. It's not in the text. The most any of the Gospels ever write about Jesus and anger is in Mark, when it says the disciples annoyed him. He was frustrated by them. But anger, it's just not there. Most of our belief, though, about righteous anger comes from an intriguing insertion in a translation of the Bible. 1611, King James of England received and approved an English translation of the Bible for the people of his kingdom. It will forever be known as the King James Version. This is a masterpiece of English literature. It was written during the time of Shakespeare. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. Beautiful verse, a beautiful translation. All other sins sound clunky and stilted. Yet in addition to the poetic license, the translators also felt the need to insert a phrase. In our reading today, in the King James Version, the translators wrote, But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. The insertion is without a cause. Sometimes it's written without just cause. Well, that changes everything. Don't be angry, oh, well, unless you have reason to be. Uh, don't be angry un unless the person deserves your anger. Don't be angry unless it's, well, it's what it must be. That pretty much justifies all anger. For at some point, we can convince ourselves we're right about anything. For more than 400 years, the Bible, because of the insertion without a cause, shaped our, our culture, our thinking, our faith about anger. In many ways, we can trace our trust of it to this tiny mistake in translation. Now, the topic of, of righteous anger or the anger of God is a whole different direction that would require many sermons. Our, our focus today is our anger, not God's. How we turn the dial. Mostly what we need to remember is that Jesus says anger is destructive. Don't trust anger. Don't follow it. Don't seek to keep it. Don't turn the dial, no matter how right or confident you may feel. Let's spend a little time with the passage to be sure that we, too, don't imply or insert something that's not there. There are three key teachings here. Anger condemns us or, or makes our life bad. Hence, if you're angry, you're liable for judgment. He says, if you insult or ridicule, use words born of anger, we're liable to reprimand or to the hell of fire. In other words, anger is a path to destruction. Instead of this path, Jesus says, resolve your conflicts. Come to terms quickly, he says. And then the third key, 
there's a series of steps with anger, kind of like a dial. The steps are judgment, prison, and punishment. It may just be me, but that's not a positive image. Jesus is not painting an ambiguous image of anger. Anger is a path. It leads to destruction. Don't, don't follow it. Don't, don't turn the dial. One thing leads to the next and then to the next, and none of which are good. Judgment, prison, judgment, the path of anger. One more piece about our passage today. Like the, the teaching last week, this one is unique. The teaching about anger is the first of six steps, so it's not unique in that it's part of a set. From, from anger, Jesus will teach on desire and then disdain, and after disdain, he'll teach on delusion, vengeance. Finally, the sixth step of the set is hatred. Each time, Jesus will say, you've heard it said, but I say to you, our passage today is unique and it's the first teaching in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus tells us to do something. The nine Beatitudes, the salt and the light, the law and the prophets all precede this teaching. But those are descriptions, things we are, things we must be. The teaching about anger is unique and that's the first thing to do. Yes, five more things will follow to do, but this is the first one, the first step, and thus unique. This is important, crucial to a faithful life, this first step, for truly the rejection of anger, losing confidence in it, no longer seeing it as a right, a tool, a justification, losing this is the first step of salvation, freedom. In American Protestant religion and tradition, we often identify the first step of salvation as the sinner's prayer. We confess our sins and accept Jesus as our Lord. And this is a tradition that goes back to the Puritans and their anxious or sinner's bench. It goes through the great revival tents of Kentucky and the burnt over district of New York. The first step as the sinner's prayer is the single focus and purpose of the powerful Billy Graham crusades that shaped the 20th century. And this is fine and well. We need to confess our sins and Jesus is our Lord. Yet the sinner's prayer is like being given a ticket, a place on a train or a ship for a journey. It's not the journey. The journey of faith, how we live unto freedom, more and more, begins in our reading today. This is the first step on the path. And the path is going to get more and more difficult. After anger, we must put down the desire to control. Then we, we must put down disdain and disregard. And after disdain, we have to lose the delusion of arrogance and false confidence. And, and only then do we confront vengeance and the need for violence. And then lastly, we're given the challenge to love the enemy. Here's the thing. You'll, you'll never reach the end. The love of the enemy unless you start by losing the confidence we have in anger. We have to stop turning the dial. And there's no skipping ahead. We must walk the path. Losing anger is the first step. And as such, it's the first step to freedom. Uh, I'm not sure we're feeling very free today. Cut off, maybe. Closed in, to be sure. Not free to move about, definitely. Although none of these are good or something to desire, they do cast a powerful light. This is what anger does, Jesus teaches. 
Anger closes us off, burns bridges of connection, tears down relationships. We can see this and feel this truth today, even if it's from a very different source. So remember the dial. One is frustration, 10 is rage. Keep the dial in mind this week. Week three of being self-quarantined may prove a bit of a stretch, but it will get a lot worse. Trust me, it will get a lot worse if we start to turn up the dial. We, we all get frustrated. That, that's life. But we all have a choice about turning the dial. We can come to see how it's never good. To be slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love is the path of patience and compassion and faith. And Jesus bids us to follow him. In this path, we will be saved from the self-destruction of anger. But to keep it, to keep following him, we have to shed our confidence and trust and anger that turns up that dial. Amen.
Let us pray. Out of the depths, we cry to you, Creator God. Lord, hear our voices and be attentive to our prayers. We pray for those in our church. May they continue to be a light to others even during this uncertain time. Help us to love as you have taught us to love. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Guide us to be the city on the hill you call us to be. And when this is over, we hope our church your church has been the example of how to live and serve during this time. We want to be the hope bringers in a troubled time that we are named to be. We pray for those who are stricken by fear and anxiety and even anger. Calm their troubled hearts and minds Help our deacons and leaders to serve those who are unable to leave their homes, whether by phone calls or handwritten letters, groceries delivered, even signs. Guide us to be your church, healing God. We pray for those whose hope is lost, who feel dried up and cut off. By your grace, open their graves, bring them back to the land of the living. We pray for those who are oppressed, held captive by the power of fear and death. Release them from their chains and unbind them. Let them go. We pray for those who weep, lost and lifeless in fear and regret. Grant them the peace of your presence. Show them what your love can do. We pray for those who are dying, the light of life fading in their eyes. We pray for healing. We pray for intervention. We pray for wisdom of doctors and caretakers. We pray for supplies and respirators and a cure. We pray for hope. Throughout this, we pray for our doctors and nurses our healthcare administrators, our delivery workers, grocery store attendants, and all who support us and keep us going. Grant them additional energy and health. For those who need our prayers today, we pray for them, and we thank you, O Lord, for having heard our prayers. Enable us to trust in you and to see your glory through Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not fall in temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite Elder Jen Fong to come forward to give us a word from our session ruling body. Good morning, and peace be with you. I am Jen Fong, uh, an elder in the First Presbyterian. And for a number of years now, I have worked with the Stewardship Commission of our congregation. This experience is inspiring in many ways, um, as the faithfulness and generosity of our congregation is a source of hope and joy. I can add to the list a special moment that happened this month. In the midst of the state of emergency, with our services being live streamed only, uh, and thus no offerings taking place, you might imagine that our giving at First Presbyterian might be down this month. Much to my surprise, uh, the giving for this March has already surpassed the giving uh, for last, mar last March. This is an amazing moment of generosity. 
people have been mailing in their pledge, dropping it off at the office, uh, at, at the, off, the church office, and even meeting their pledge early, knowing that this might be a hard moment for the church. I, I know my own family um, has set up automatic giving, and it just goes every week. So this is amazing. So first, let me just say thank you. Your generosity makes a difference. Next, as the session met last week to discuss, we will continue to worship virtually and suspend all programming besides our food ministries. Yet, we will look for creative ways of being a church and offering hope. Look for e-blasts and on our website, uh, directions in the coming week to see what we have come up with next. This is a challenging time, but our congregation will not only make it through, we will make a difference. Lastly, remember that we are in this together, even if we cannot gather together. God bless you. Thank you. Don't, don't go too far, Jan. Don't, don't, we're going we're gonna to say farewell here. So. There's X's on the ground. If you want to find an X, anybody who's here wants to find an X is, is welcome to come forward and do that so we can say goodbye. Um, read Ella again. Wow. Uh, I, I, it was tough preaching after that because uh, that was my sermon. I was done. And, <laughs> and, and Amy, uh, uh, well done singing without crying because I, I, I was tearing up. Thank you, Jen, for the work from the session. And uh, uh, we, we realized uh, last week that you know, we end our services by saying goodbye at, at, at doorways and, and parking lots. So we need to do that each week, too, because this is an important piece to say uh, until we meet again. So with that. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> well spoken thank you <laughs> so as you go forward um, look for creative ways to offer the peace of God and, and please keep, try to keep your hand off that dial to this end may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord be kind and gracious unto you lifting up his countenance upon you now and always saying peace peace be with you Amen. Amen.